Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a curriculum development specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Yes. Welcome back to the podcast. Last time we talked to Todd Short and Eric Vandenberg about public <laughs> events and how we prepared for them in the past up until today. Um, Today, we're continuing our conversation about what sorts of suspicious behaviors we look for at these events. So in our first episode, we talked about the importance of establishing a baseline at at an event. So can we now dive a little bit deeper into how we use that baseline to identify identify suspicious behaviors and activity? Using a baseline allows you to be able to figure out the norm from the not norm in simple terms. When people are at any type of event or venue, we expect a certain type of behavior. That is your norm, that's your baseline. But when somebody deviates from that, that's when it raises our suspicion. And that's why campaigns like See Something, Say Something are so important to be able to let people know. If you see this, this type of activity, this is not normal. This goes against what should be happening here. Um, <clears throat> for instance, people taking unusual photographs. Now, if we're talking about parades, that's going to be normal. If you're talking <laughs> about something like the Mardi Gras or marathon or even uh, a concert, people are gonna take pictures. But what they'll be taking pictures of is gonna be focused on the event. It's gonna include them to prove that they were there. It shouldn't be looking at, for instance, security that might be at the event. That might be a little bit suspicious. If somebody's taking pictures of checkpoints, for instance, or they're looking at the, maybe the utilities that are present that may be vulnerable at the particular location, as some examples. Mm -hmm. Ashley, when I think of pre-operational behaviors, I think of a handful of different things to try to expand my view of the world, especially in terms of thinking about baselines. So anytime I'm working an event, whether it's small scale, medium scale, or large scale, the bigger the venue, the more nervous I get, because obviously the more people can present the biggest problems to be able to secure. And I would say number one presents the biggest bang for the buck for somebody that may have ill intent. So when it comes to pre-operational behaviors, I I pay extra special attention to areas where there's going to be larger congregations of people and or things. If you're going to spend the time, the energy, the money, and or anything else to be able to attack a specific area, you probably want to get the biggest return on your investment. So if I'm going to Mardi Gras next week, it's next week, right? My math is right. Mm -hmm. Mardi Gras. So if it's that, if it's the Mm -hmm. Super Bowl in Vegas on Sunday, Anything in between, if I go to a 4th of July parade, if I go to a marathon qualifier where there's 15,000 people running 26 plus miles to be able to make it to Boston, I'm paying extra special attention and putting additional resources in those areas because, quite honestly, it's necessary. I would say, secondly, the other thing that I'm looking for when working these types of events, and this goes for just not safety and security people, go for anybody. I would be looking for people that are trying to maximize their fields of view while not being noticed. And I guess an example of that would be, you know, it's not illegal to sit on a park bench during a, during a parade route. It's not, but if somebody is perched on the top of a truck or on the top of a building and they just happen to be, peering out for longer periods of time than what I would consider to be normal. And by normal, I mean, if you're baking in the 4th of July parade on top of a building and you're out there for two plus hours, that's pretty bizarre. If you're out there for over half an hour, I would also call that strange because you're, you're, that sun's going to beat you up. 
I think in addition to that, I would look for people that are curious in nature. And by that, I mean, it's weird to admit this, but I've, I've been approached at various details where people have come up and asked me questions about the event. Questions like, how many, how many people do you think are attending this right now? Questions like, how many officers do you have working this event? Questions like, um, well, that's a really good looking squad car. <laughs> how many squad cars do you have here? How many agencies are represented? Do you guys have like security staff too? Those security, those, those, do those security people, do they wear like badges and guns and stuff? Those kinds of questions, um, if they're not coming from a seven year old, are generally out of the norm. So um, I think those are very, very curious things to ask somebody that's working in an official capacity at an event. I would say along with that particular point, I'm also looking for obvious and non-obvious vulnerabilities that can be exploited because no matter how good our security plans are, they're never going to be perfect because nothing in life is. And if I'm going to look at those, I'm also looking at people that may also be exploiting those same types of weaknesses or potential weaknesses or vulnerabilities. People that for whatever reason are trying to get a door open on the side of a building that may be a half or a block and a half away from an event, especially if it's on a weekend and those buildings are closed, is abnormal behavior. And those those are things that I would consider pre-operational that makes the hair in the back of my neck stand up. And actually, the, the question that I'm usually asked is, before you launch into action, based upon what you're telling me, what's your final trigger point? What's the thing that really makes you go? And my response to that is, it's subjective and it's going to be different for everybody. But mine is, when the hair on the back of my neck stands up and the hair on my arm stands up, the goosebumps are or encompassing my body, then I usually take an action because if I don't, mm -hmm. then I'm probably ignoring my instincts. And if I'm doing that, then I'm probably putting people in danger. It's at least worth an investigative stop. It's at least worth a follow-up conversation to see if we can dig a little more. Mm -hmm. And I, everything, I agree with everything you said there, Todd. Um, <clears throat> when it, when you work in the event, and somebody comes to try and elicit information, how many people are here, how many, you know, who watches those cameras that are up on the street poles? That is the kind of thing that, ooh, mm. that doesn't seem like a normal question. And again, outside of a seven-year-old asking it, yeah, it's definitely going to be suspicious. And you want to know, why'd you ask that question? <clears throat> Looking at people who try to get into areas that are restricted where it's authorized personnel mm -hmm. only. That is another thing you want to pay attention to when you're working these type of events. Typically, you're going to have pre-event security when you have something planned. So you're going to take a look at the area before you get there. Uh, you may send out a, a team to check to make sure that there are no suspicious devices left around, nothing where somebody could leave something. I know in New York City, what we do is... <clears throat> During a lot of these major events that are planned, we might remove some of the garbage cans that are on the street. It mm -hmm. doesn't mm -hmm. bode well for littering, but it takes away the opportunity of something placing into one of those receptacles to cause harm. Um, <clears throat> uh, I can tell you that when the president comes, whatever route he's going to take, they will solder down the manhole covers. So somebody can't put something underneath the manhole cover they will seal the uh, base of a street lamp, which usually has a door that you can access the wiring. But it's a great place for somebody to be able to place something inside to cause damage because it's right along, along the route where this event may be taking place. So a lot of that <clears throat> free preparation is what we're going to be able to do to guard against people... Uh, being hurt in an event like that. <clears throat> if the bad guys are watching us, they'll also know that we're doing some of this stuff. Eric, what's your thoughts on <clears throat> surve surveilling on scene versus virtually? 
like if you're the bad person and you really want to target an event, would you do a little bit of both or one or the other? And why? Both. I would do both. <clears throat> well, I can give you a case study uh, because this actually happened. And uh, we talk about it in 2010. Individual parked the car in the middle of Times Square, New York City, with a bomb in the back of it. He did about four months of research on the Internet trying to figure out the best place to park that vehicle where it could cause the most damage. Now, <clears throat> that is not going to give you all the information going on the site like that because it's limited as to what you can see. You have to have boots on the ground, basically, at the location to get a real holistic approach to everything that's going to be there because something could change from what you saw three months ago on the Internet to now. There could be a construction site. There could be, <coughs> excuse me, a, a building that was removed. Uh, maybe traffic was rerouted, for instance. So you, it's an advantageous for the bad guys to be able to do both. I've always argued, Eric, that even if you do a lot of virtual surveillance, which I think is incredibly valuable because you can sit back and you can take your time, you can take four months, and even look at traffic patterns and parking patterns, ingress, egress, all that kind of good stuff. I've always said that if you're really going to do it and do it right, eventually you're probably going to have to put boots on the scene. It'd be like in starring in some kind of action 007 movie and you show up and the manhole cover has been soldered down or that garbage can has been ripped from the scene or, or there's a fill in the blank box car that's delivering chicken outside of a Chipotle outside of time center. It wasn't supposed to be there at the right time. Whatever the, or there's a vehicle at whatever, you, know, you just never know what's going to happen. So if you're going to do it, right, you're probably going to have to be physically on scene, which gives us an advantage based on some of the things that we're talking about. If you see somebody in, on a park bench for four and a half hours and their field of view is over some critical infrastructure, whether it's a bank or a, you know, whatever the case may be, um, that may not be worth, maybe worth asking that person a question or two just to verify what they're doing and what their intent may be. And then they realize, oh, they know I'm here. And they think what I'm doing might be suspicious. Maybe I should go somewhere else. Which kind of goes back to one of Ashley's earlier questions about the, the invisible versus the visible deterrent, you know, which is us, those people on the front lines doing it. I think there's a time and place for all that stuff. But when people start asking strange questions, or appearing repeatedly at high target locations. That's absolutely a red flag. I remember years ago, I'll call it BC before COVID. We had a gentleman that was trying to rip off an ATM machine and like actually pick it up and take it with him. Where he was going, so I have no idea. <laughs> Those are very, very heavy. There was only one person. So when this place, <laughs> this person was placed in handcuffs, taking him to the county. And he started asking questions about the size of the engine in the cruiser. It's very odd. So we happen to have a, a local FBI office you know, in the Champaign area where the University of Illinois is located. We had an officer that was assigned to it. So we took that person's information and was and we gave it to our rep in the JTTF, to our terrorism task force, so they could dig deeper. Uh, this particular person that was arrested it didn't nothing additional necessarily appeared but it's nice to, to know at least in a database that those people exist so if something else happens in the future you got some intel and you got some info at least on where they live contact information that kind of good stuff maybe even fingerprints and yeah exactly and pictures you um, betcha. going back to strange questions um some of the other training that i do here on the side of new york city is we train transportation workers. And we actually had an incident where a bus driver was approached by somebody and this guy was asking unusual questions. It's normal for people to come on a bus and say, you know, how many stops are there or how crowded is a bus during a certain point of time. But the question, and he was starting with those, but the one question that really sent chills down the bus driver's spine, you talked about hair raising, was the guy posed this question to the bus driver. He said, how much gasoline is in the tank of this bus? Who asked that? That has... <laughs> exactly. Who asked that? 
Talking about baseline behaviors, Ashley, that would be above the baseline of acceptable questions to ask someone. Yeah, even I, would, uh, even I would be raising my brows at that. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you how many gallons are in the truck that I drive, mm. let alone one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, Fascinating. Fascinating. It happened. Surveillance, the... So can you talk about... Um, some of the things or some of the steps that a terrorist would take prior to the event to prepare for the attack up until they kind of execute it? Well, the first thing they're going to consider is what their motivation is. Uh, what do they hope to accomplish? Um, do they want to, I don't know, change a form of government? Do they want to hurt a lot of people, cause mass casualties, just cause disruption? So that's going to factor into what their uh, target selection might look like. Um, once they decide on what the target is, that's when the pre-operational stuff is going to start to happen. Um, as mm -hmm. far as target selection, that's something that can be done offline with research. Uh, they don't necessarily have to go visit any place. They can, and they have in some cases in the past, but... It's, it's not essential to be able to pick it. Uh, it's something that'll fit whatever their objective or goals are to achieve by doing this. But once they decide on what that's going to be, that's when they start going through the steps of the actual planning. Um, they're going to figure out what the vulnerabilities are. They're going to find out what asset might reside at a particular site or who goes to a particular event and who are they going to target. Um, <clears throat> that's going to kick off where they need to gather information because that's going to be key. Uh, that involves the, the taking pictures, the asking questions, the conducting surveillance, the, the trespassing and the, the probing and breaching. That's where that's all going to come into play so that they can gather as much information about either the event or the, the, the venue where this might be taking place and the, what the vulnerabilities are. You know, and actually there's a, there's an escape evasion component of this too, because not everybody wants to get caught. So, or or die by suicide. Right. Or die as a result of it. Absolutely, Eric. So one of the things that you know also we need to look at is those transportation points, the ingress and egress points, the switching of the vehicles, all the stuff you see and you know, on fancy Netflix movies. So there, there's a reason those, those movies exist and they're not all fiction. So when you're, when I'm looking at those, these types of plans, I'm also thinking about if I'm in New York city and I have to get from point A to point D very, very quickly, what is that route? Cause that A through D route is going to look very different, Eric, if you live where I live, because if you're not surrounded by eight and a half million people and a ton of traffic, uh, your your escape and your evasion may be more difficult, you know, depending on <laughs> there's not going to be as many people necessarily that would see you going from point A to point D. Um, if you have a fantastic vehicle description, it's a whole lot easier to get caught. Unfortunately, we had the Highland Park parade shooting. Was that in 2022 on July 4th? That was the one where the, the kid was on top of a building overlooking a parade route. And uh, he shot and killed people. Many more were injured. He actually, um, what, after he did the shooting, he, he dropped the rifle, which was recovered pretty quickly by law enforcement was in the area. It was reported that he had a change of clothes that were a female orientation. So he would be able to disguise himself in a crowd and make him appear not quite so um, suspect with female clothing. And then he hops in a car and he's when he was head towards Madison, Wisconsin, to potentially do the same thing. Apparently, he had a change of heart because he didn't make it to Madison. But a couple, once they put that vehicle description out in a fairly rural area between northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin, there were some people that saw the suspect in the vehicle, as described, and they were able to get the, the cops involved. And that's how they apprehended him, fortunately, without further incident. So that escape... And the evasion clause, I think, is very important in their overall planning. You know, and I always think about media exploitation, too. 
Eric brought it up in the beginning of this. If you're going to select a target, you're probably going to select a target that has some meaning for you for various reasons. You know, Eric's a New York guy. Certainly September 11th is a long layered story that we could talk about for months and months. But how many major incidents have occurred in this country where the bad person or the bad people that targeted a particular area didn't have some kind of a uh, an agenda, some kind of socio-political something or another that drove them to to select that target? And so if you're done with your attack and you've got a body count, if you've got property destruction, if you've got uh, political upheaval, why would you want, want to take credit for that? And of course, as we know, just because you're the first one that goes on TikTok to announce that you're the one who did it doesn't mean you're necessarily the one that did it. But obviously, we get some breadcrumbs there to start trying to find the bad people. And that, that starts a, a larger discussion, and certainly a more intensive investigation to be able to, to get where we need to be, which is apprehending the suspects. So it's a multi-pronged, multi-tiered process. Um, you know, in some ways, as, as horrible as the implementation of the act is, it doesn't end there. In some ways, that's just the beginning for so many more of us, because if the active shooter is done in five to seven minutes, per federal statistics, we still got a lot of work to do when, when this whole thing is over, because just because one attack has happened doesn't mean we're not going to have a second. One of the things that we preach in law enforcement from the first day in the academy is, you know, if you're, if you're searching a building and you find a bad guy, what are you looking for? I'm looking for another bad person. If I find a bag of dope on somebody during a search, what am I looking for? I'm looking for another bag of dope. So the same thing applies. Just because one incident has happened, we've been fairly fortunate in the states where we haven't had coordinated complex attacks as much as we've had overseas. But like we said earlier in our discussion, what generally happens internationally can find a home here. I think about the Paris attacks in 2015, where you've got multiple prongs hitting multiple locations at the same time basically dividing resources and making a mitigation response strategy very, very difficult. But those are the things that I think of, Eric, when it comes to pre-op activities. It's just not necessarily the attack itself, while I'm certainly focused on that, but it's it's really what's happening, what what got me there, and then what direction do I have to, to veer off in after the thing has occurred. You bring up a good point, too, when you talk about some of these uh, complex coordinated attacks. Is what resources do you have to be able to address that type of uh, attack. Where I come from, obviously, with the 800 pound gorilla in the room, where we have many, many, many resources to be able to deal with, as opposed to smaller, maybe rural agencies don't have the the resources to be able to handle something like that. It makes a huge difference. I mean, you look at the average police department in the United States. What are you talking? Seven, seven and a half officers, you know, for a police department on a national average. Mm -hmm. There's only so many yeah, New normal. York cities. Yeah. There's only so many. Chicago's and LA's and Houston's out there. And even if you go to those agencies now and you say, do you have all the resources and Every the money that you could ever want, now. they're going to look at you and they're just, yeah, I mean, they're going to look, absolutely not. We're not even close to where we need to be. So, you know, that adds to the challenge yeah. of being able to deal with this because people are working longer hours. I think the stress, you know, is, is higher than it's ever been. And I think all those things factor into fatigue, which factors into our response. And so I'll come back to saying, and if you get nothing else out of this podcast, vigilance is so, so important because you are very important. If you're doing this for a living, you are the line between what is happening and what could happen. And if your intent, which it should be, is to be proactive, why did you get into this job in the first place? Then your your actions, basically, you know, should be should be subsequent to that response, Eric. In my humble opinion, good humble opinion, but you're exactly right. I'm 100 percent behind you. Vigilance, especially now where you have a lot of uh, instances where officers are the ones being targeted too. And we've seen that in your city. The machete attack comes to Just mind recently. Yep. What was the the details the of the machete attack? Well, <clears throat> it was prior to the ball drop in Times Square. It was several blocks away from uh, where the ball drop, but uh, it was right before the security perimeter where this individual decided that I guess he felt the cops weren't paying attention and he went after somebody at one of the entry checkpoints. And 19-year-old kid who had been radicalized on the internet um, attacked and injured several police officers before he was uh, 
taken into custody. That could have gone a lot worse. It's a bad day. You know, when, when we talk about vigilance and taking action, you know, it's so important. I always preach, you can't live your entire life in condition red. Like, to put that in perspective, Ashley, like red would be like, I'm on point all day long, and then I've got an orange, or I'm kind of in the middle, and then I've got a yellow or a green, where I'm just laissez-faire. We all can't, whether you're whether you're in duty or not, you can't work an 8 or 10 or 12 hour, 16 hour shift in condition red all the time, because you, you, it's too much, mostly you're going to fizzle out. But I'll say this, mm -hmm. especially if you're suited you're going up. You to cardiac arrest. You better, you better be at, a, at, an, at an orange red because you got to be able to hop and that when you're when you're out working these details you don't have a choice your head's got to be able to swivel all the time it can happen anywhere at any time we've been hearing that since the first day of the academy it's as true today as it was 150 years ago but when it comes to executing the attack very low green i like to be you know like ready to pounce <laughs> eric you know in a, <laughs> at a moment's notice i like to save the energy in the green level so low and then pounce <laughs> I got to save it for when I need it. No, you're not wrong. No, about believe that. me, I, I, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I may not be a cop, but I, uh, I do have a, I have one child. Um, I'm a first time parent, and anytime I take her out, um, alone, I my my head is like on a swivel. I was like, I feel like I'm her bodyguard. Like I'm just. <laughs> I feel like after working this job, that's kind of how I am now <laughs> in public. But Ashley, when yeah. you do this for a living, when you're around people like us, it changes. It changes the um, <laughs> your lens. It changes the way you see the world. It doesn't make you yes. a weirdo. And at the end of the day, you are her, his or her. What's your baby's name? Mm -hmm. Josie. Can you hear me? <laughs> Josie. You're Josie's protector. You know, we strap Josie. Yeah. Strap on. We mm -hmm. strap on the uniform and go to work. We are the protectors of whoever, you know, we're around. You know, it, it's a shared effort. We talked about the see something, say something campaign mm -hmm. and how simple it is. I'm glad Eric brought it up because I I usually don't think to bring it up. Even though it's so incredibly it's just rudimentary. I think everybody understands that. How many tips do we get? when things have been stopped as a result of, hey, this person's been parked outside this residence for the last like two and a half hours. Nobody's ever parked outside of this residence. Can you come over and check this out? Because this is, this is wackadoodle. This doesn't make sense. That's why it's important for people to take pride in their neighborhood so that they, you know, people in the community realize what's happening. Um, <clears throat> going back to what we were talking about before, being conditioned to be vigilant. I've been retired for quite some time, but today, even when I take a subway train, number one, I will not sit in a seat because I want to be ready to pounce or escape. Um, when a train pulls into a station, we were trained when I was a transit cop back in the <clears throat> 1980s. Um, we'd have to look out and scan the platform to see what's going on. I still do it today. I want to know who's getting on my train. Um, I can tell you when I go to sit in a restaurant, I never sit with my back to the door. I still want to see who's <laughs> coming in the door of the restaurant. I'll sit in specific places well, here, when I go to a movie theater. Eric, here's a funny story about a restaurant. So in May, I will have been married for 25 years. It's a long time to be married to anybody. Congrats. Little on me, right? So um, I'm going to have to put up with you. Yeah, she's she's so lucky, Eric. So um, we have a we have a restaurant. I was just waiting. I threw a couple lums in there to see if I could get some laughs. We had a uh, a restaurant that my family has historically gone to for anniversaries, birthdays, special events. And one of my wife's greatest frustrations with me is generally when we go to this restaurant. It's a Friday night. Maybe a Saturday night. People are getting off work. There's a line forming out the door. There's there's 15 people you know in the in the whatever lobby waiting to got their name on the list trying to get in the restaurant. And in this particular hibachi restaurant, you know, imagine a restaurant where they've got you know seven or eight hibachis, eight people to a hibachi. There's one in particular that's in the corner 
that I can observe the front door. The bathrooms are right off to my right. And so, Ashley, I hope you find this funny. I will routinely, as a matter of practice, if we're waiting in line, allow you and your family to go before my family until that hibachi, the one that I want, where I got a nice hostile surveillance field of view here, Eric, is is available. So, you know, can tack an extra hour on to dinner. And so it drives my wife absolutely insane. My kids oh are my pacing. God. It's just not good. So this is exactly what happened. I'm not making this up. I was not here this particular night, but I can empirically document this, this case study. One particular night at 515, one of the kids <laughs> comes in, looks at the hostess, takes the gun out and says, give me all your money. What do you think the hostess does? Poor thing, right? I don't know what to do. Looks, looks well, for you in this particular abachi. abachi. Yeah. The nice thing about abachi restaurants is there's generally a couple of sushi chefs that are behind a glass cased enclosure with the knives and doing their stuff. Big so uh, we generally say in the business, yeah, big knives. Mm -hmm. Generally, we say don't take a knife to a gunfight. Actually, it's not generally a good idea. In this particular case, these two <laughs> wonderful human beings like Batman and Robin, like Starsky and Hutch, use their superhuman 22-year-old strength, yourself. leap over the little glass enclosure thing and take the knife to the gunfight. Fortunately, it was a pellet gun. It wasn't a real gun. It looked exactly like a real gun. The fight ensues through the little area where everybody's waiting to eat. It spills out into the parking lot. Somebody calls 911 because they saw something, so they said something. So here comes the cavalry, multiple police mm -hmm. departments, because we're working in a Twin City area. Everybody shows up. We were able to put handcuffs on a on a person that does definitely deserve to be in jail. So when that story hit our local news, yeah. I instinctively looked at my wife and I said, that's why I do what I do. Because you just never know. When somebody comes into <laughs> a restaurant, they're not going to rob the bathrooms, which are off to my right. They're going to rob the front of the store, which is where the cash register is. So to put this in the perspective mm -hmm. of what we're talking about here, Ashley, if you're going to select a place, good target mm -hmm. selection. Because it's a Friday night. They got money. Everybody's lined up at the door. It's a good night. To, Monday mm -hmm. night's probably not so good. Had this person probably perused this particular area yeah. to see when the moat? Yeah, they did. When they got there, was he scared to implement the attack? No, he was not. His escape plan was flawed, and his escape plan his escape plan was flawed because of the sushi. Pe don't 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 rob a place with a bunch of knives. I mean, it's tough, right? You may not be able to get it. And fortunately for us, I mean, the, in the, hibachi, the, they have people that are good with throwing up the knives and they're, stuff. They're doing the things. <laughs> the broccoli, I got the yeah, volcano. I think Meat cleavers, yeah. They're very precise. Right? So whether it's yeah. small scale, medium scale, or large scale, I think it's fascinating to go to to know what has to go through somebody's mind before they go and do something like this, because this is a game changing experience. Whether this event is going to be successful or unsuccessful for this person, it's going to alter the course of their life forever. Because if it's successful, maybe they get away for a mm -hmm. while, but they're going to be hunted forever. And if it's not successful, they're going to spend the rest of their life incarcerated, which does not sound like a good idea to me. But anyway, little uh, little restaurant Sorry. number for you. Uh, so that's all about all we have for today. Um, next time, we'll finish up this series with a discussion about creating and executing a plan. Thank you so much for joining us for this week, and we'll see you next week. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next time.